as a teenager, you know, what was primarily on my mind was either um, sexual energy or spiritual energy. You know, a teenager's natural sort of inclination towards the occult. And these aura images were incredibly present. They were all through books on the supernatural, the occult, and the beginning of the New Age movement. The Curlian aura photographs had been made since the 1930s, even though they had this prior history in the 1700s, this long lead up through the history of electricity. And it interested me as an artist, the idea of trying to conjure up a very unusual technology that you couldn't just buy off the shelf. The Curlian cameras produced a number of bodies of work. Uh, the first one was part of an exhibition called Cosmic Vapour, I think in 2010. And they were black and white images. I was very locked into the memory of those images that moved me as a teenager. And I was trying to recreate that sort of archival, really kind of scientific look. The next obvious step was to do the colour images. You know, I spent a lot of time out in the wild country of the Blue Mountains, bushwalking and rock climbing and recording and I thought it would be really interesting to do a study of specimens that specifically came out of the Wollamai region because it's so special and obviously there's a Wollamai pine which is mythological but it was interesting to work with these plant specimens you know within the context of this sort of rarefied terrain of contemporary art you know how could you produce interesting floral art you know, that within itself is a kind of challenge. But once you start to overlay all, this other, all these other dimensions on top of it and have it produce other dimensions, it becomes a very powerful object. So everyone wants to know about the aura. Is the aura thing real? You could take a living object like a leaf and make an aura photograph of it, then cut the leaf in half and the aura from the part that had been cut away would remain. But it's highly questionable that that is what is going on and it could never be continually repeated consistently. And so as a fact, it never stood up factually in terms of science. And so for me, that tension is a really interesting one within itself. The, the actual astrophotography, the, the photographs themselves, are often background material to other kinds of translations. I'm very interested in the way that this information is translated through a lot of different mediators. But the thing I like about the astrophotography is that, uh, you know, you get to look into the dark night and that's a real opportunity to put deep thought and contemplation. But it's also at the limits of what, um, you know, camera technology is capable of um, being able to translate. These mediators are translation machines. They translate things. And all they're doing is converting energy. And in fact, everything is like that. I think that's the ontological basis of reality. And so, you know, and photography's, we always question photography's reality, but whether it's real or not, but I think it's completely real. Even when it's false, it's real. You know, a huge part of my practice is in, in this other realm, this virtual realm, um, and, you know, that involves algorithms and fractal mathematics and um, simulation and synthesis. It's like you're conjuring an image out of nowhere, literally out of a vacuum. And that vacuum is a mathematical space that is so concealed, it's an airless space and yet it seems to um, bring into the concrete world these images which feel so real, so credible. And to me, that's uh, kind of magic in action. I have the real world in front of me to photograph with a conventional camera, but I can come back here at three o'clock in the morning and inhabit an alpine mountain range you know, by manipulating software in a particular way, and I see it appear before my eyes. The Numenon Ranges is a fully synthetic image. And as much as I know that, it's interesting that a lot of people don't necessarily see that it's synthetic straight away. 
and there's this overlay of place names on it. When I make a synthetic landscape, I have every right to name its features in whatever way I like. I do like renaming star constellations as well. I think everyone should have the right to, you know, write the world in the way they see fit. You know, we're wrangling chaos into these compositional structures. You know, you, you puddle a bunch of blue paint around and it becomes a picture. And in a way, the camera is framing the world and capturing that moment. And it's composing the world by virtue of those choices. And of course, artists don't have an exclusive license on that. You know, I walk out in the landscape and it's continually synthesizing and composing itself all the time. I've had a long-standing interest in photographing the sun. We're really looking at the source of life and the source of vision itself. For me, as an image maker, that's a profound experience. You're seeing the colour red and orange in a way that um, is kind of unimaginable. And if you think about artists, you know, they have a great capacity to empower things like colours. <laughs> and so you're working with, a, um, with an optical system that uh, tunes out absolutely every part of the spectrum except for that, that thin band of energy. You can't quite believe that it's real, what you're seeing. You know, at, that's the sublime at that point because it's almost too much. It's at the limit of, um, of, of what, what is even possible because you can see all of the boiling energy of this thing that is um, absolutely the source of our existence. You know, artists live through their senses and the job of an artist, I think, is to arouse other people's senses. And, you know, and we do it through all of our all of the skills that we acquire to wrangle all the chaos into these incredible compositions. So, you know, we, we tune chance to our creative ends. <laughs> Artists tune chance. That should be a t-shirt. <laughs> no, bad t-shirt, scrap that. Chaos Wranglers, that's the new band name. <laughs>